Uh, today is January 25th, and I'm really excited to go into this new realm that uh, we have decided to take on. Uh, you know, Garth Stein, good friend of mine, well-known author, uh, super dad, excellent husband, everything else. I can't say enough about him. He and I have put together this new podcast called Uncanny Valley. And uh, what I'd like to do is, uh, you know, I'd like to share with you what we plan on doing, what our goals are. So on Uncanny Valley, Garth and I will spend time with you and our guests discussing the future of humanity. Our concerns include technology, the future of human evolution, societal development, and more. We'll look into the ethical and moral questions that are being thrust onto us, and some would say with developments like genetic engineering, artificial intelligence, reprogramming the human genome, you know, happy topics. So while we have or will develop our opinions, we feel it's best to let viewers develop their own. And so we have chosen to structure the podcast in the form of an unstructured conversation. One of the topics that's consumed my mind over the past, well, last year, are the unforeseen indirect in interacting effects of otherwise separate developments. Automation, for example, fusing with AI, external cognition, aid technology, merging with genetic engineering. Wait a minute, what's external cognition aid technology? That doesn't exist yet. Sorry, I'm jumping ahead. For some, this stuff is the content of nightmares. For others, it's what makes up their dreams and their life work. It's the reason why they get up in the morning. It is by all appearances, no longer science fiction. Join us as we peer around the corner into the uncanny valley and beyond. And with that, I'd like to bring on two excellent people. We've got Garth Stein and Adrian Mayer. Un uncanny valley, it's real, it's here, people. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we're doing. We, we were going to be talking about this kind of thing. And the reason why we wanted Adrian on is because she's got this fantastic, fantastic, uh, uh, fantastic book. I want to get the title right. Gods and Robots, Myths, Machines, and Ancient Dreams of Technology. But before we go into that, what I'd like to do is go over what the Uncanny Valley is. So the Uncanny Valley is this relationship that was proposed in 1970 uh, between the um, likability or the acceptability of things that are somewhat human-like, like dolls or robots, etc., and you know whether or not it, how similar it is to an actual human being. And the farther away you are, people are like, "Oh yeah, look at that. That's a jack o' lantern." Okay, I get it. It's fine. But as you approach the similarity to human beings, you end up actually going through negative emotions, like things basically freak you out or they seem uncanny. That's where the word came from. And, and then the score goes up the closer that you come into being, uh, you know, close to humans as well. So, um, you know, we're going to go in a few directions here as we go over time. First of all, we've got to load up who we are. Second, um, Let's make this right here. Sorry, we did, just me in the studio here. Um, so we all have experiences like this. I mean, I once knew someone, she was female, uh, then thought that that matters, but the plastic hair on a Ken doll, if, if she ever saw a man wearing plastic hair uh, on, the, on the head, like a Ken doll hair, it, it gave her that creepy feeling. Have you experienced that? Well, I, I think everybody's got uh, a creep, creepy threshold. And I was going to ask you about the Uncanny Valley because, you know, it's the title of your show, but it's also uh, we can find evidence of Uncanny Valley sensations even in Homer, described in Homer, Iliad, and in the Odyssey. So people have experienced that for a long time. It's obviously an evolutionary uh, maybe a defense mechanism. I think it probably is. And I have tried to engage with whenever I talk to a uh, computer uh, and robotics and uh, AI people, I ask, why are you trying to bridge this uh, uncanny valley? Why do you see it as an obstacle? Why don't we accept it? I would rather see uh, 
them just to embrace the machine-like quality of uh, right. robots and AI instead of trying to get past this obvious defense mechanism that we have evolved. Um, and everyone I talk to uh, in in the field of making robotics or AI, they can't seem to wrap their head around that uh, it might actually be a good thing that we have this this uh, sense of creepiness. It, who knows? Maybe it's there to defend us from something that's coming later, or maybe it it worked uh, in the past. Um, and we we all, it's timeless and it's universal. So what was so, the what uh, was the re what was the reference that you recognized in Homer in the Iliad uh, to the uncanny valley? Uh, in the in the um, well, let's go to um, Homer's uh, Odyssey first. There, there's a scene where uh, Odysseus, who's trying to get home, he makes a trip to the underworld, and in the while he's in the underworld visiting ghosts who are nothing but shells of their former selves, they're very sad he also sees encounters some paintings that are hyper realistic mm -hmm. hyper realistic and he's uh odysseus jumps back in fear because it's a portrayal of murderers and other monstrous beings that that is, they are so real that it just freaks him out and he actually exclaims i hope this artist never uh gets to work again because these are too frightening they're really creepy uh, they look so real, and yet they're not. Um, and I think uh, I th there are other examples uh, uh, of um, plays, for instance, from the 5th century BC, plays that feature characters that encounter hyper-realistic statues at night. And if you look at uh, ancient statues, either marble or bronze, to us they don't look that realistic, except they are uh, technically fantastic uh, in, in reproducing human faces and bodies, but in antiquity they were fully painted with very subtle colors and pigments, and even the pigments were even mixed with wax so that uh, they would have a texture and a kind of uh, uh, more skin-like um, appearance to them. They even inlaid eyes and eyelashes. Uh, um, silver fingernails, they had ivory teeth, they looked hyper-realistic if you ever see reproductions of them uh, or how they must have been in hmm. in antiquity and if you think of encountering uh, life-size and lifelike statue like that in a human-like pose at night in a temple and they're and they're not going to have electric lights. It's going to be like an oil lamp or a candle, something like that, flickering light or moonlight. These things look really real, and there are plays of um, uh, tragedies got, and sorry, comedies. Sorry, Adrian, you've, you've got a yes. ton of stories, so we're going to get to yes. all of them. We're going to get, give you lots of lots of time to tell your stories. But I wanted Garth. Yes. Garth, do you, do you have any personal experience of of it, like realizing and recognizing that you've fallen into this uncanny valley? <laughs> Into the uncanny valley. Well, well. Yeah. First of all, I do want to uh, go back to that Ken-like hair. Um, <laughs> as, as a child, I was traumatized by the character of Donald in That Girl. That's going way back into history. <laughs> With Marlo Thomas, as you may recall, uh, was That Girl, and her her boyfriend um, Donald had this hair that was fixed in place. <laughs> it was like a hat. And it, it, it really kind of freaked me out. I was like, how do you get hair like that? And who has hair like that? It, it looked like a piece that he put on his head. Yeah. Um, so I do definitely have uh, experience with the, with the uncanny, uh, uncanniness of that. But this idea of the, the very human aspects of it, the ivory teeth, the eyelashes, and these, these colors, because we in school learned when we learned about, you know, Ode to a Grecian Urn, you know, we were under the impression that it was, it was so-called primitive art, right? They didn't take into account all of these details, but in fact, they do. And it makes me think about, um, I'm here in Seattle and uh, my, my mother's family, Clinket Indian descent from Alaska, the masks used in, um, in the stories that they would tell, the cautionary tales around the fireplace for the Clinkin Indians um, involved a single source of light, a fire in the middle of the room. And in the shadows would be the elders wearing these masks and they would jump out and they would dance around to, to try and scare the kids into being 
good. Um, but these masks, if you look at the originals, they had human teeth in them sometimes. They had human hair frequently. Uh, there was mother of pearl inlays and so forth. And, and really, talk about if you were a seven-year-old in a longhouse in Wrangell, Alaska, um, I imagine yeah. that, that that would make a very big impression on you. And that, so Absolutely. that is a very, it seems to be cross-cultural, this, this whole idea. Right, and I do have a slide uh, that shows hyper-realistic um, bronze statues, I think. Uh, I don't know if you can find it there. It's near the end. Um, sure. It's not necessary to show it, but... Uh, sure, it's easy to do. See? There it is. Oh, look and at that. So you can see, and so you can see these are not even painted, but you can see how real they are uh, that with the inlaid eyes. And now just imagine that they're painted with lifelike wax pigments. And uh, seeing those in firelight, you would take them to be Yeah, it makes me think of Madame real. Trousseau's Wax Museum. You oh, yes. The, yes, the, the number of you know it's that funny. Can't enjoy that experience at all. <laughs> I know. It's just, I can't look at those things, right? I know. They're um, the older ones. The ones actually made by Madame Tussaud and uh, the people right after her seem so much more realistic than the ones they make nowadays. Though, maybe they're stepping back from making them hyper real. I don't know. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's, it's 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 possible. So. You know, um, your book itself is really a joy uh, because, you know, we really don't have a, a frame of reference. Most people don't have a frame of reference with which to go back to the ancients, uh, is, is the foundation of Western and, and Middle Eastern culture. I mean, the, what we have is, oh, you know, people that go to college, they learn about the Iliad, they learn about Homer, they might learn a little bit about... You know, Aristotle, the Jason. We know Jason from Jason and the Argonauts and so on. <laughs> right. Right? But from the yeah. movies. But your book is a fantastic, I don't know, reference po point. It's a series of reference points. It's a, it's a lens through which you can go back in time and see that world through the eyes of the people who were there. And, and that's why I wanted to have you here because, you know, I don't mind going through. I, in fact, I, I asked you for the slides. I would like to go through them if we could, if that's all right with everybody. Sure. Um, there's videos of you giving your full lecture on this, but I wanted to, this to be more conversational. So if we interrupt, right, of course. if we interrupt, it's not because we're being rude. It's because we're interested. Oh, no, please do. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. So this is your, um, we'll, go, we'll go here. So go right ahead. Yeah, well, you know, essentially what I gathered, I, it occurred to me that these were the first uh, science fiction stories. And we're talking about uh, how people in antiquity, and we're talking, and now I'm talking about Homer, that's, that's uh, 700 BC. Some of, the, uh, uh, some of these stories come from 750 to 650 BC. So these are stories that imagined how one might create artificial life. And the oldest one, uh, the oldest example we have comes from a uh, contemporary of Homer, Hesiod, and that would be uh, the bronze robot Talos. Uh, and, the, and he was featured in, uh, in that cult movie from 63, the Jason and the Argonauts, one mm -hmm. of my favorites. Um, but this, uh, this creature was really a robot, and he was imagined 2,500 or years or even more that long ago, people could imagine uh, that someone, Hephaestus, the god of invention and technology, he's also a blacksmith, he was able to forge this bronze android. And we know, we know that he fits the definition of robot. Now, definition of robot is controversial. Um, you guys probably have your definitions, but basically it means something that's self-moving, often in the shape of a, a living thing like a human or an animal, and that they have uh, not only self-moving, but have inner workings and some sort of power source. Well, hmm. this the very first story we have in Greek mythology of a robot has all of those features. He has, uh, he's self-moving. He could march around the island of Crete uh, three times a day. That means he went like 500 miles an hour, I think. Uh, but we're talking about science fiction. And he 
was tasked with spotting uh, invading ships. They were very worried about uh, uh, piracy in those days. And when he spotted a strange ship, he would grab a boulder and throw it at the ship to sink it. But then he also had uh, uh, capability uh, at close com at close range. If uh, anyone actually made it ashore, he could heat his bronze body red hot and then grab up a victim and hug them to his chest and roast them alive. So this is a really dangerous killer robot. And we know he had, yes, here he is shown uh, throwing uh, boulders um, on coins from Crete, ancient coins from Crete. And we know he had inner workings. We're, we're told that he had a single vein or artery or conduit that went from his head down to his foot. And in that uh, single vein or artery, uh, he didn't have blood. Instead, he had ichor. And ichor was the mysterious life fluid of the gods. That's what made them immortal. And so he, he actually was powered by this. It's almost in a kind of primitive idea of the way many people think about electricity, even though we know that there have to be two, uh, uh, a pair of uh, a voltage, whatever, uh, for electricity. Often people still imagine something, a single uh, pulse, pulsation of power. And that's how the, how the Greeks imagined it. And the entire Viva system was sealed with a bronze bolt on his ankle. And uh, so we know so that he guy, had inner workings Talus, and a right? power this, source. This, this robot's yes. name was Talus, right? So this automaton. Yes. And he was huge. Yes. He was a huge bronze creature. There. Giant, yes. And who made him? Allegedly. Hephaestus, the god. Uh, he was a um, uh, the blacksmith god, but he's also the god of technology and innovation. So this, this uh, uh, story is a... Yeah, yeah go ahead. He's the Elon Musk of uh, Homer's. Era. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. That's right. There you and go. and he uh, he's using he's always pictured he, he's an interesting god. He's the only god with a job, and he's the only god who sweats. I mean, he's always described by Homer as he's at work in his workshop at his forge, and he's always perspiring and working very hard. Um, uh, he's. Uh, He's shown um, using the same tools and methods and materials that an ordinary uh, Greeks of that day would see in a blacksmith shop, but he's a god, of course. So he can, uh, whatever he produces will be awesome and um, uh, spectacular, far beyond what any human uh, uh, artisan could achieve. So, so, so the myth is a science Jason fiction. And, sorry, yeah. Talus here and Jason in the I like that. I loved this yes. show as a kid. I had no idea what it was about. It was right up there with <laughs> Planet of the Apes, you know. But there, well, this is the one it's scene straight that up I remember. Godzilla, if you look at it, yeah. This is the one <laughs> scene that I remember with, uh, you know, this. this yeah. I thought it was made of stone, but okay. So then this this is a, a model of it. I take it right. This and... is a bronze uh, cast. And this was cast in Scotland uh, from the original model that uh, Ray Harryhausen made for the movie. Great. And you can see it's starting to crumble and um, uh, looks like a lot of wear and tear there. It's it's very old and, and crumbling. Cool. And they decided that. to make the, the cast uh, look like, uh, they made it from the original model, but it also looks like when Talos is destroyed yeah. by Jason and the, the sorceress Medea that he happened to have along with him. Uh, lucky for them, uh, she figured out that if they would remove the uh, oh, here's Talos. Uh, that's Talos crushing victims to his red hot chest. Um, they um, okay. So who were these victims? <laughs> Why would he crush them? What what did they do wrong? I I don't I believe that uh, those two victims did have names. This is on an Etruscan bronze mirror. The Etruscans had their own interpretations of Greek mythology, um, but we do know that that is supposed to be Talos crushing two victims. Um, they somehow inv invaded the island of Crete, and Talos belongs to the king of Crete. Uh, King Minos, and the whole Minoan era is named after this mythological king right. of, of Crete. So they must have uh, somehow got ashore, and now he's uh, uh, crushing them to his chest. Right. So here we've got this. We've got this uh, robot that's hurling rocks. That's his job. He's protecting the island. 
So what was the conflict that came about that they felt that he was out of control? I mean, what was? why would they want to take him down? Well, uh, King Minos was given Talos by Zeus. Zeus commissioned uh, this um, bronze uh, guardian uh, to give to his son Minos. So it was commissioned by Zeus, made by Hephaestus, and given to King Minos to protect his island. Um, and he's supposed to be a perpetual motion machine. He's supposed to go on forever, right? He's got Icor, uh, which makes him immortal. But uh, Jason, the Argonauts have just come back from their quest for the, for the Golden Fleece. And they have this wonderful sorceress, uh, Medea, with them. She's coming back with them. To Athens and on their way back they stop in Crete they're very tired they want to rest so they're approaching the island of Crete and Talos spots them of course and uh, begins throwing boulders but they make it into a small harbor and get ashore and Talos is now coming toward them and Medea has a plan I mean she's just a sort of a techno wizard from antiquity she she figures out how to uh, disable or and destroy uh, Talos, the bronze robot. She happens to know that he's got this inner working with this uh, uh, conduit filled with Icor. So she says uh, that maybe maybe that makes him immortal. But if we can remove that uh, bronze bolt on his ankle, mm. the Icor will all flow out and uh, we'll destroy him. So she, two versions. It, in one, she hypnotizes him. Uh, and in the second, she convinces Talos that she can make him immortal. Now, here's, here's an interesting um, lesson for us today. He, he is not supposed to be making his own decisions, right? He's supposed to, he's got a task. He's supposed to recognize strangers and then destroy them. Uh, but she somehow gets to talking with him and somehow guesses that he has developed a sort of humanoid desires. He's sort of a, a cyborg creature. He's half human, half machine. And she, she figures that out and convinces him, I can make you immortal. He doesn't understand his own nature. So he agrees with that. And that's a very human desire uh, that they're talking about. 2,500 years ago, they're imagining that this bronze robot um, would actually want to be uh, invulnerable or immortal. I feel and so bad she for says, Talos "I can do that." Now. I know, I know, and He's you sure. feel bad for him. He's he's, he's killed for doing Howard, his job. You know? Exactly. I, mean, we come, we, I know. We come back around yeah. to that in Blade Runner, which is also in the book, of yes. course, which is brilliant. You know that this idea yes. of first of all the I core they sweat. You know, in in aliens, remember in Alien when yeah. the the android uh, gets injured and he starts sweating white milky fluid. I core, yes. I assume. Yes. But here's yeah. the question I have for you: um, is um, this bolt in the ankle? So if the so Hephaestus does this, Hephaestus is like the master builder of all time. He creates this thing for Zeus, which is the perfect uh, defensive um, century. Yeah. Theoretically, it's it's being uh, powered by Icor, and so one might think that um, since gods were involved with this, that perhaps it's a sealed system. And you know, why on earth does um, is there a bolt in his ankle? It, there must be service. The bolt in his ankle suggests that he is a serviceable <laughs> android. There you go. Well, that needs oh, refreshing like that. every now and then of the Icor, right? <laughs> Otherwise, how? Why would you need the bolt? We'd seal that up. We can defeat Medea, no problem. Exactly. So, uh, that's a good and, point because you yes. know it's it, there, there has the to be a fatal flaw. It it tells us that everything mm -hmm. has a weakness. I think the lesson there yes. to us is that no matter how big your opponent, no matter how bad they are, they have an Achilles heel. They have a, a weakness about them somehow, and so do you. Don't ever think that you are that is me that is us. They never think that we uh, are invincible. I bet you were talking about me, Jack. Yeah, yeah, I know. I'm trying to be nice here. <laughs> I have so many flaws. I've got bolts practically <laughs> up and down my legs. That's how many flaws I have. But, but so that's a good point uh, um, because uh, we've got this techno wizard who figures this out. Uh, 
she's like, you want her on your side, right? If you're going to meet uh, automatons that are killer robots, she yeah. she's like a hacker. There's always a vulnerability, like you said. There's always yeah. some weak point, Achilles' uh, heel to whatever technology is built, even though it seems like the most advanced, like Hephaestus is supposed to be make, making the most advanced uh, uh, technology, and yet a hacker like Medea comes along and can exploit uh, the the um, vulnerabilities, and one of the vulnerabilities is, is his human-like desire to uh, make a, a decision, he makes a bad decision to uh, become immortal and allow her to remove that bolt. Uh, but she also is exploiting that weakness that there is a bolt, that there's a bolt at all. Yeah. Um, yeah didn't, she, um, didn't she help with another, um, who else did she help with techno wizardry? Didn't she help defeat another foe? Yes. Uh, once again, Jason, the Argonauts, um, uh, he's got all these tasks that are set for him by evil kings right. uh, uh, that he needs to uh, get past or accomplish if uh, if he wants to get to the Golden Fleece. And so the, this king, Aetes, uh, says, well, I will tell you where the Golden Fleece is, but first you need to uh, plow a field and plant some dragon teeth in the field, and you need to plow the field with my two uh, bronze bulls, ferocious bronze bulls that breathe fire. These are robo bulls, right? They're, they're, they're once again, robot uh, bulls, and he has to somehow subdue those two fire-breathing bronze bulls, and yoke them to a plow, and then plow a field and plant a helmet full of dragon teeth, and then kill all of the automaton soldiers that are going to spring up from the uh, dragon teeth. And he has to do all this by uh, by sundown. Uh, so Medea <laughs> helped figure out. Yes, there's, there's, nothing, there nothing he is. Like a deadline, the right? <laughs> <laughs> deadline, that's right. So here's Jason attacked by the fire-breathing bronze bull. <clears throat> right. And here he is yoking them. Bulls. So the, the dragon teeth, they, did they ever say where the dragon teeth came from? Dragon, dragon. Uh, no, but uh, no, but um, but there was a dragon uh, um, that that was uh, in Medea's land and in this king's land that was guarding the golden fleece. So apparently they're infested with dragons. They have plenty I'm of dragon because teeth. Because my sons are, are fossil hounds. And I if oh they have yes. Teeth, so, but the dragon's teeth. Well, are, that's are possible. Plowed, yeah. Are plowed into the field. And, yes. Uh, there's Medea collecting the ichor from. Yes, Prometheus's wound. So, um, yes, what what sprang out of the? I, this was in Jason and the Argonauts as well. They, they, they were yes. an army of army of automatons that were fighters. Soldiers, yes, it's right? an it's a unnatural a unnatural um, army of men uh, pop up out of the ground, fully armed and programmed to attack, and mm -hmm. so they they just keep popping up out of the ground, uh, and they want to attack. They will go toward. Uh, here's is a medieval um, image of of those soldiers uh, emerging from the ground, and okay. of course they're going to attack Jason and the Argonauts. He's got to somehow uh, um, uh, overcome them and defeat them okay. uh, by sundown. And and, and Medea actually um, figures out. Oh, and this is from uh, Jason the Argonauts sixty three movie. Uh, they. They made them uh, look like skeletons, which I think was really brilliant uh, mm -hmm. uh, because it's sort of eerie and scary. Um, it's a really memorable scene. We don't really know what they looked like in antiquity. We don't have any ancient images of them. They were just said to be uh, an unnatural soldiers that popped out of the ground fully, fully armed. Mm. And they attack and programmed they to attack. Anything and that, they attacked anything that moved or anything that hit them, right? Yes, anything that attack. It, well, they are programmed to engage with uh, with whoever's there, and so it's mm. going to be Jason and the Argonauts. But Medea um, exploits their weakness. Uh, she advises Jason to throw some stones into their midst, uh, and the stones will trigger a sort of cascade, a domino effect. As they as the stones hit their shields, they think they're being attacked, and so they attack whatever is closest to them 
and they attack each other. And so now they're in a frenzy of attack, attacking each other, and Jason the Argonauts can rush in and finish them off. So once again, she she figures out the vulnerability. The, this is an army that cannot be led, can't be commanded, they can't halt, they can't retreat, they can only attack. And so she figures out how to force them to attack each other. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so the lesson of the story, the moral of the story there, guys, is listen to your woman, right? I mean, <laughs> that's well, there's always going to be a back door. Hackers should always look for the back door, yes. the bottom line, right? I mean, because the, and the, the, and, yeah, they're not those, these things, these robots are much more, um, are these androids or whatever you want to call them are much more sort of the, the beginner level right? Because they don't have the artificial intelligence to be able to um, figure out that theoretically um, Hal from 2001 would, would have it all figured right. out by now. Yeah, right, so here's right. Jason. Uh, they, these are more primitive. The, the rock into the midst of the army here. Yeah, and then they turn rock. on themselves and they beat themselves up. So, you know, um, there are so many, as you, as you go through your book, you, I couldn't help but find examples that have me convinced that um, so many writers of new pieces of fiction drew inspiration from these scenarios. So new new writers like um, uh, I, I'm thinking of the guy that wrote Star Wars. Um, I forget George who, Lucas. Yeah, George Lucas, for instance. I mean, these are epic stories of monumental proportion of massive tragic failures character flaws right all of these we think of them sometimes as devices if we're trying to consider how to put a story together but they're almost fundamental to our species i would take it if 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 right the ancient fables are the original science fiction or the original fiction they they have a parable they have a lesson and you know um, the the interesting thing, you, you know, of 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 the weakness that's there, and how it certainly is re referred to instances of like the the, the leaking of the of the um, fluid, the I core, out of yeah. the ankle. That's been referenced in modern modern. Let's see, let's see, let's see him dying here. You have this. Dying well, there's a. Um... Here. Yes, that's. I wanted to go back to when you said you feel sorry for Talos yeah. because he's he's killed uh, just doing his job, right? He's doing his best. Uh, he's that's doing right. what he was uh, right. meant to do. Um, and and if yeah, you so uh, if you look at the at the image uh, that was made in the fifth century B.C. on this vase, mm -hmm. it's, uh, you can see that uh, Ray Harryhausen. I don't know if he ever saw this vase, but they're in the same position there. <laughs> and you're, you're feeling sorry for both versions of Talos. And if you, uh, if you look very closely at the vase painting from the 5th century BC, you can see that it, it, he, uh, Talos is made to look like a bronze man. You can see uh, he's, co he's colored uh, the sort of uh, bronze yellow that they used for for bronze armor and he's got rivets and uh, seams and then if you look closely at his face in that I think in the next slide there's a yes uh, the artist has actually put a teardrop uh, flowing from from his eye and I think that this this is really amazing in antiquity that um, they too felt very sorry for Talos. There were two tragedies, ancient tragedies, written uh, about Talos. Unfortunately, they're lost now. So we can imagine that he was presented as a sympathetic character. Oh, hmm. Do you think there's any chance that they might be discovered somehow? <laughs> well, now that would be exciting. Uh, you know yeah. where we? You know, I always hold out hope for lost uh, texts because you know where you know where most of them are found in mummies, in Egyptian mummies. They uh, stuffed them after they took out all of the yeah, like, uh, like internal newspaper, organs, like your wrapping glasses like, or something, right? You're moving. They they wadded up uh, papyrus <laughs> and and stuffed the mummies with this, and so what? anyone no. anytime they find new mummies, yes. 
Every anytime so I find Aristotle's <laughs> the famous lost treatise on comedy that Aristotle wrote is is in some mummy right now. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, we can hope. Um, <laughs> they just did find they did find some uh, a new text, uh, not a, a new to us text that had thought been thought to be lost uh, that was uh, from Aristotle. So yes. Uh-huh. Every now and then they find something really important. Usually I mean, it's like next, a shopping list or a yeah, right, to-do right, right. list. Or... <laughs> next you're going to tell us is that one of the mummies has a chocolate mummy inside of it. And, mm-hmm. Oh, wow. We, we can hope. Onion, I don't know. <laughs> age, age, fine aged chocolate. Yeah, fine aged. <laughs> so so in, your, in your research for the book and, the, you know, you, you, your, your own deep dive on this, did you... Did you find obvious parallels for, oh, I know like George Lucas, I know that I suspect very strong suspicion that this guy, you know, ripped off this, uh, this ancient uh, parable. Well, you know, the one, the one that comes to my mind when you bring this up is Mary Shelley and her mm-hmm. story of um, the Frankenstein's monster. Uh, it's very interesting. She called that the new Prometheus. It was a subtitle of her of her book. That was written in 1816. And um, around that time, uh, there were some discoveries of some exquisitely carved ancient gems that showed Prometheus making the first humans. Mm. And uh, um, I have quite a few uh, of those images in my book. They're very remarkable because they show Prometheus building the first humans uh, starting from the inside out. He actually makes the framework. He makes the, the natural skeleton of a human being and then fleshes it out. So it, it's almost as if he's building uh, the first humans as automatons, right? They, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That uh, that just kicks off so many philosophical questions that have been um, uh, uh, pondered since Plato. Plato is the first, I think, to, first philosopher anyway, to say, let's imagine that we are just automatons or puppets of the gods. Anyway, um, I think Mary Shelley was influenced by that particular myth of Prometheus making the first human. Am I, out am I, am of, I get, I'm getting um, close to it here. Is this... Uh, do you have a slide? No, to the gems. Yeah, the gems. Uh, I think I'm not sure if they're going to be in here. I hope so. <laughs> we have so much to talk about. It's uh, the, your book is so so, so thorough. Uh, yeah, we'll get we'll get to all of that. I'll let you finish your story. Go ahead. Okay. Um, well, he's building he's building the the human being part by part, step by step, mm-hmm. and she has Victor Frankenstein build uh, his his automaton or android or uh, uh, whatever you want to call whatever he was building. Uh, he thought it would be very beautiful and wonderful, and he used. Um, body parts from corpses and uh, put them together in a, in a very similar way uh, to Prometheus uh, in the gems uh, 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 using body parts put step by step to create the first human. Um, but what I think is really interesting is that uh, Victor Frankenstein is disappointed in his android or his um, creature. Uh, he, he's repulsed and revolted by him and he disowns him in the end. And Prometheus um, takes pity on, on the first humans. In fact, that's why he steals fire to give to the first humans because he's uh, he feels pity and empathy for them uh, that they're naked and vulnerable in the world and they don't have all these wonderful uh, attributes and capabilities that his brother Epimetheus gave to all the animals. I mean, they were supposed to divide up all of the attributes and things like claws and teeth and fur and uh, wonderful stuff, eyesight yeah. and hearing. Yeah, all the good stuff, all the apps, right? right. <laughs> By the time they got to the humans, Epimetheus said, oh, oh, shoot, I don't have anything left. And so yeah, humans went out to the world with nothing. everything, yeah. <laughs> I know. I didn't I even know, know there was an Epimetheus. I mean, that's, like I such a, that's such a revelation in your book. I was like, wait, there's an Epimetheus who screwed it all up? Oh, yes. What's going on? <laughs> I know. Well, you think, and I, I point this out in my book, and I think this has real reverberations for us today. 
especially when I uh, come to uh, talking about your article, um, Jack, uh, the article that, that you sent um, on bio uh, biotransformations. Um, Prometheus's name and Epimetheus's name are really uh, a part of the story in antiquity. Prometheus means foresight. It means the ability to look ahead. And so Prometheus is looking out for the creatures that he made. Uh, he's, he's like an archetype of a, a responsible creator who uh, has empathy for and feels responsible for what he's created. And uh, Victor Frankenstein is the opposite. He's uh, maybe more Epimetheus-like because Epimetheus means hindsight or the inability to look forward. Uh, Epimetheus is uh, always going for the short-term gains. He's the one who never looks ahead to, uh, to, to the consequences or even advantages. He just goes for the, for the short term. And in fact, Epimetheus was the patsy that Zeus chose uh, to send Pandora. He sent Pandora to Epimetheus, and he knew that that Epimetheus would accept this beautiful artificial woman without looking too much into the into. I wanted to get into uh, Pandora because what was going to happen? People, nobody <laughs> knows what Pandora really is all about, right? Pandora is a robot. <laughs> nobody <laughs> knows the true story of Pandora. What we hear is she opened up a box. There was no box. We were t we were lied to. There's no such thing as Pandora's <laughs> box. I have a box here. Hang on. It's just an a urn. I have a box here. It's a jar. This Pandora's is jar. WWDNYK Pandora's box right here. It, it's full of things that we're not going to talk about. Oh, don't, no, open no, don't, don't open it. Open it. Don't, don't open it. <laughs> you don't, don't want to open that. <laughs> all the miseries. So let's get into Pandora. Um, first of yeah. all, who she re uh, who created her and who who's that person related to? The person who created her was the god Hephaestus. Once okay. again, Zeus commissioned uh, Pandora. He commissioned Hephaestus to build an artificial woman, uh, an artificial woman that would be evil disguised as beauty. That was that. Those were the specifications of Zeus. Now, Zeus in many of these ancient Greek myths is a very tyrannical, harsh, severe, vengeful god uh, he's not a kind benevolent god and why does he want to build pandora and uh, why does he want to build this uh, uh evil disguised as beauty because he's angry that prometheus stole fire from the gods to give fire to mere humans and we can talk about that and that uh, fire of course is a technology that's the first technology that human beings had. And uh, as many people point out, fire allowed them uh, to uh, um, clothe themselves. They, they could now gather around the fire and uh, invent language. They could plan cooperatively. They could make tools uh, to uh, hunt with and then protect, each other, uh, protect themselves from each other. They get some autonomy from the gods with this fire. So no wonder Zeus wanted to keep this as a divine uh, technology and not share it with with humans, so he wants he punishes Prometheus. We saw the slide where he he chains Prometheus to a rock and sends his eagle uh, to peck out the liver uh, of Prometheus uh, on a daily basis because the Greeks understood that the liver could regenerate, and so this is part of the punishment: is that this eagle comes at the same time every day. Uh, and there is a version of that legend that says that Hef that Hephaestus was commissioned to make uh, this giant eagle out of bronze. So it's almost like a drone that comes and uh, punishes Prometheus. <laughs> so Zeus punishes Prometheus very harshly, and now he wants to punish humans for accepting the gift of fire. So he, he lights on this idea of, I'll send an artificial woman uh, and uh, I'll send her as a bridesmaid to some uh, guy on Earth. And once she gets there, uh, she will open this jar, which will uh, be her dowry. Um, and once she opens that jar, uh, all of the suffering that human beings uh, will be plagued by forever will be released. And um, that's what he does. Uh, Hephaestus makes 
uh, this artificial woman, and then all the gods contribute uh, to her making. It's almost like uh, Zeus has the intellectual uh, idea, the concept, and then uh, Hephaestus uh, makes the hardware, and then uh, the, the, all the gods contribute the software in a way. Um, it's a little weird, they, that whole that whole concept, <laughs> because it's sort of like um, um, uh, Orient, Murder on the Orient Express meets James Bond, you know? Like Everyone's it, responsible. Everyone's responsible yeah. for killing. And then yeah. but on James Bond, you can't just kill James Bond if you're an evil person. You have to invent a clever way of doing it. I mean, if <laughs> Zeus had just like, destroyed all of humanity, it would be over. But no, let's create a, a robot sex woman who's going to go down and, and, you know, yes, get some guy to fall in love with her and open up her, her urn. Yes. I mean, it's really a lot yes. of work, right? It's a lot of work, but it makes a good story. And that's why sure. that's why these stories... That's why we have them today, right? Because they're good stories. I think they're, Zeus they're had really, issues. Um... I just think Zeus had issues. I mean, <laughs> yes. he's not, he's not a nice guy. He, you know, he not a just nice said, guy. You know, fire. Let's give them wisdom on how to use it. But no, he has yeah. to punish them. He has to exact vengeance. You know, yeah, if you think about it, all of technology, everything that we have, everything that we know, is possible because fire allowed us to do things like create bronze. Right. Oh, right. It, it's smelting and that led to gears gears led to yeah. understanding physics right yeah. and so on so everything about you know, in, in that article that you mentioned i talk about evolutionary realms and and yeah. uh, garth has a nickname for me he calls me e3 because um <laughs> well he was he was a little bit shocked that somebody could project all of the future of humanity into a single equation with like two terms. <laughs> As a novelist, well, so, I doubt that that's possible. I just you don't still think doubt it. I think you're. I think you're doing smoke and mirrors, man. I still <laughs> okay. believe that. Well, that's what scientists do, though. Um, I re I really enjoyed the article. I a lot of it went way over my head, but I really liked the um, the two the two more where well, you had the first threshold, the uh, the hyper uh, realm that uh, now we have crossed and we can't go back. Uh, one person or a group can be in touch with millions of people and there's no going back unless we lose all of our technology so we're doing uh, it right now course. because i expect millions of people to sign up for this uncanny <laughs> of course. valley and, uh, <laughs> and by the way everyone should read this book um adrian mayer's book uh, gods and robots is a fabulous book i mean it's just so much fun to read especially if you've studied you know you do the high school survey class you get to college you know i consider myself an educated <laughs> ivy league educated dude here i should i know i should know about the antiquity and i know a fair amount but i was just blown away by this book and all this sort of new uh ideas of technology that were um secreted away in that you can find out about in the book that they were doing in uh, a long like before the like the idea of creating a self um powered self-actualizing uh creature to give it a goal, right? Okay, you're going to protect this island, or you're going to have, you know, you're going to release all the miseries on the world, whatever. Or you, you're a, a liver hungry eagle. <laughs> you can give them a, a a thing, but this idea not not only that, in this this is an interesting idea that you touched on very the very beginning, which was why is it that robots have to look like ro like people? Why do we anthropomorphize yeah. them constantly, right? Why do, what is it about that? Why does it have to be uh, a, a, a doll-like and, and end up not being very good so it looks more like some scary horror movie instead of just <laughs> a titanium arm that does the job it's yeah. supposed to do? It's a brilliant observation because if, you know, people want to, um, even the Turing test for artificial intelligence, the Turing test for artificial intelligence is if, if human beings cannot, tell the difference between a computer program and a human, then it has passed the Turing test. And that for years was the test. The question that you're asking becomes, we already know that human intelligence isn't really that good. <laughs> it's just, we're not that It's we're better on wise. some days than others, Jack. <clears throat> <laughs> I, well, the point is, if we're going to create an artificial intelligence, do you think this artificial intelligence, once it starts to 
create new artificial intelligence and create a super intelligence, is it going to measure itself up to humans or are human beings going to be a long distant memory where it's exponentially far beyond? And this is where the uncanny, this is this topic is going to come up time and time again with Uncanny Valley. I wanted to share with you guys this image, which I ripped off from an Internet web page somewhere. The map of artificial intelligence ethical issues short term, there it is, long term, AI as agents or AI as subjects. And there's four quadrants there. How do we handle consciousness in an artificial life? Is it going to even be human like? Will they just, you know, take off? And uh, do we enslave them? Do they have rights? These kinds of questions. And this is going to come up not in a theoretical way, but in a real way. No. Right. So yeah. well, let's take a little let's take a little journey here. I want to show you guys a video of something that I think it's really, really, really stupid that we're doing right now. Okay, <laughs> Boston Dynamics is a fine company, I'm sure. The, the stupid thing that humanity is doing, we're sowing the seeds of our own destruction with this right here. If it'll play. Come on. In when we're winning, we'll be singing. kind of thing now what's stupid there is not that he's kicking it over right it's a, it's an ai uh in the sense that it learns how to balance itself and can navigate and avoid things the stupid thing is that they recorded themselves doing it that's right the ai of the future is going to have access to all of youtube and it's going to wonder <laughs> in the bat where did i come from who are my ancestors oh, and no. how how is humanity treating robots all around the world well i mean i mean, I mean it's uh, just it, it's the godlike thing right because the bottom line is those are the creators of the creature so basically they feel entitled to abuse it how they see fit as zeus would in the tradition of the zeus great like. zeus abuse the Zeus abuse is a very natural inclination <laughs> that people have. The Zeus right? abuse, we now have a name for it. I love it. So they, they want to show, they want to show how dominating they are. And so, you know, of course, one day, um, pride going, however, when the storm happens, the point is at one point they're going to get their comeuppance when the AI singles out the creators of those and says, now you have to pay for spanking my little baby. Well, that's what I'm saying. I could I could totally see a sci-fi movie, right, where there's some future AI and everything's cool. We're all getting along just fine. And then the AI decides, then... you know what? All right, the time has come. And humanity goes, why? Why? And they say, <laughs> well, just, just why? Oh, come on, that's me. I mean, am I wrong? I mean, we probably should not record this. If, what it is, yeah. these, these are balance tests, of course, to make sure that the thing well, can do, you know, you're pushing the limit, pushing the extreme. But the AI well, is going to have to, to understand that that was part of the design testing and not go, I know. why did you do that what? to my <laughs> ancestor? Right? Well, I have a problem with you now. It's disturbing because they make them look... Uh, it, they make them the more you try to make them look like a real dog or a real human the more empathy people are going to have for them and then it brings up just like you said the question of robot rights if you if you uh just embrace the idea of them as a machine and had them look like titanium or uh, the monolith from 2001 or something like that you you wouldn't feel uh the same empathy but and the other reason they're doing that to those uh 
Boston Dynamics robots is because they plan to use them in warfare. And so that's another thing AI will have against us, I think. They'll have PSTD. <laughs> um, it's, it's <laughs> and remember, robots can inherit memory. We don't oh, inherit memories. We get a reboot every generation. That's amazing, but though. Robots, Lucky for right? us. Yes. This, your book, for instance, any book that you can pick up, this, this is an external... Uh, device. This is an external communication. This is an external memory device. You take from your mind, you put it in here. It can transmit through. We were talking about the lost writings of Homer or somebody. You know, <laughs> it, it, we could trans vertical transmission of knowledge didn't exist until there was writing. But robots, I mean, AI, they'll have access to everything for as far back as they can access in, 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 in super time. So I want to go back to Pandora if we could, because it's such an interesting full story. Pandora, this hot chick that was made by the gods, you saw a parallel with respect to a movie. This, this image right here on the vase up at the top. Um, yeah. Here, how she's, tell us, tell us why this Pandora is such up an at the unusual top. pose for, uh, well, for, for this uh, um, kind of rendering. This is a vase made in the fifth century BC, so two thousand five hundred years ago, and it shows, mm -hmm. it shows the uh, Zeus is uh, was described by Hesiod as uh, once Pandora was created, um, all, and all the gods had given her their uh, um, attributes, things like that. Uh, Zeus then sh had a demonstration and showed showed her off to all the gods and you can see she's standing there in the top row standing there uh, like a statue um, very still and looking out at us everyone else around her is shown in profile and they're also shown very uh, they're very active they're all in motion they're they're talking and gesturing about this uh, marvel that Hephaestus has made for Zeus and the one reason it's uh, such a striking vase, and it's a big vase. It's more than uh, more than a foot tall. It's a really beautiful ceremonial vase, but it's extremely rare for a person to be looking out from a painting on a vase. They don't look out at uh, at the viewer that way. Mm -hmm. She's uh, looking straight out at us, like a st standing like a statue, and. Uh, the only things that were shown in antiquity you know, on vase paintings looking straight out uh, would be a mask or uh, someone who is dead. So it, it's used for inanimate objects. The artist is uh, hammering home that idea that she is artificial, an artificial woman. Uh, but if you can uh, get any closer to her face, I don't think you can in this picture, no. uh, maybe in another no, one. But I wanted to bring um, something up here. This is a, a yeah. comparison that you made right here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Looking straight Metropolis. out. Yeah. This is Fritz from Lang. Metropolis, one of the, yes, one of the greatest science fiction films about an evil robot uh, made in the form of a uh, beautiful woman um, uh, to wreak havoc on, on the uh, ordinary people and she's made by elites who plan to enslave all of the uh, townspeople. What's interesting is Metropolis was made uh, just a few years after the invention of the word robot so you can see that th just the concept of a robot really took off quickly and and that movie was made in the uh, I think what 1927 something like that yeah. so a few years yeah. after after the word robot was invented it was I, well, I went for it in preparation as part of my research to talk to you I went back and I watched the scene where he brings <laughs> you know there's the dead woman in the in the cabin cabinet and yeah then he animates the robot with her i -core, I guess it is and, and because what he has to do he's got electricity and then he's got chemistry yeah. behind him the chemistry's all boiling <laughs> All of this stuff. Yes. And for some reason, he picks up... The two, mad scientist. <laughs> the mad scientist. He picks up two rods. I'm not sure what they are, but they look like thermometers or something. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, pick, move things around. And the actor, you know, it was, it was pretty non-realistic looking at it today about what he was doing. But for that time, you know, they had the yeah. electricity, the big electricity. And, and so right. Pandora being created to bring this evil as... Uh, you know, sorry, Garth, I'm going to keep you new week. I'm good, man. 
<laughs> That's a joke. So <laughs> don't filibuster on me, Jack. Come so on. Pa Pandora <laughs> went to, to to the planet, right? Uh, uh, to punish us for daring to enter into the same technology that the gods have to make Pandora, right? I mean, right? Yeah. Not supposed to yeah. touch this. Don't touch this. Yeah. Right? Yeah, and, and here yeah. she is on the outside of a vase with a highlight. And now you can see that she is smiling, and it's a kind of it's kind of creepy to have a statue like artificial woman <laughs> smiling at us. Um, that also is extremely rare on on a vase painting. Uh, mm. No one ever is smiling or grimacing or um, uh, showing any emotion in their faces, and. Uh, uh, but the emotion that she seems to be sh uh, showing seems to be of an inanimate object. So it's very uh, sort of, I would suggest that the people who looked at this vase might have felt a kind of uncanny valley feeling uh, when they looked at it because mm -hmm. uh, of the strange, the strange uh, yeah. looking right out at the viewer and then smiling in this uh, weird way. Yeah, we take it for granted. We we see these things all the time, but for them to always have the side view and all of a sudden she's looking out yeah. and to have some emotion yeah. too. Uh, and then that, to be smiling. That was, yeah. yeah, that was intentional for sure. Um, yeah. Okay, so then, then what happens is uh, we have um, Hermes presenting yes, Pandora, Hermes. Pandora holding the uh, jar of troubles to Ep Epimetheus. Yes, a perfect patsy because he's only going to see how beautiful she is. And Hermes will say, uh, Zeus has sent this wonderful gift to you, this beautiful bride. She's more beautiful than any uh, any woman you'll ever meet. And uh, um, uh, here she is. She belongs to you. And Epimetheus uh, really goes for this, even though his brother, Prometheus, attempts to warn him, uh, don't accept this artificial woman from uh, uh, from Zeus. He doesn't say that it's an artificial woman. He just says, do not accept a gift from Zeus. It's She's no good for you, bro. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> that's what it trouble. looks like he's saying in this trouble. Uh, but as it's you can see, Epimetheus is pretty raring to go there because she's so beautiful. And uh, he goes for the short-term gain. And so I've often... Um, thought that uh maybe we need to be a little more promethean and look ahead and uh yeah this it's interesting uh, because maybe, you, you have the, the foresight in prometheus the hindsight in epimetheus and you're thinking yeah that this might be some kind of an uncanny valley of of a warning don't go there right the lesson yeah. is listen to your brother don't go there with the outcome <laughs> being right any any man that sees a beautiful woman like that is going to say get out of here i'm forget it right <laughs> Not any man, yeah, but yeah. Men, most most prototypical men, if you will. Uh, so so then we know what happens with Pandora's box, and we have this disastrous consequences. But this was your whole. Can we just go back a second? Because this was total entrapment. I believe that <laughs> Zeus did not have a case. I think that that all the other gods were cool with the fire thing, and Zeus is like, well. <laughs> Then I gotta trick them into getting punished. Then I can't. They have to become complicit in their own demise. That's Zeus's big thing, you know. That I you, think you can't that's just a good be, point. Yeah. yeah right. Yeah. He, he that's has a good to point. Tempt. They have to. They have to get that temptation and then fail. And that's he, right. Epimetheus has to fail in his test, so that we all can be punished. That's right. Thanks, Epimetheus. That's right. Right. Well, and by, uh, that logic, uh, when pro by that logic, doesn't, <laughs> doesn't that mean that Christ nailed himself to the cross and martyred him? Like, well, it doesn't mean that he didn't have someone paid to do it. I'm just telling you that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going there. Well, <laughs> but no, it's there's, a good allegory. Point, no, there's allegory and morality yeah. in, the, in, the, in, that, in that story because he's reanimated. Christ is reanimated by the same kind of de a deity, a force. If you think and he does it, go along we're with so it. close to Christianity as a culture, you know, it's very difficult for us to say, oh, wait a minute, there's an I core, there's, there's some kind of, you know, mysticism there that we don't understand. Yeah. And the lesson is to be good to each other, not necessarily, you know, don't mess with fire, this technological thing. But, you know, the, the, the beautiful lesson in Christianity is to is to really be good to each other. The, the the because the tyrants are always going to be there to put you down anyway kind of thing but you know the, the focus in your yeah. book your focus in your book gives us a lesson the, the, there's there's parallels whenever a person has power 
does the power corrupt or do corrupt people to to corrupt and bad people are they drawn to powerful things that's that's right. a, a deep question right it, it, and first it, i just want to say garth is right about the um uh the entrapment and um maybe maybe the other gods didn't go along with it we know that when when zeus commanded hephaestus to make the chains that would chain prometheus to the uh to the rock uh, Hephaestus protested and did not want to punish Prometheus. So uh, mm. I think you're on to something. I think it, it is just, it's the, the tyrannical, harsh uh, um, autocrat, the god, uh, the king of the gods. It's just playing with um, us like we're ants or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> just, just playing with us, right? It's just like a future yeah. AI will play with us. As if we were automatons or puppets of the gods. Right. That's right. Exactly. But and but um Jack, what I interrupted you. I forgot what question you were talking about. I yet. was talking about the fact that you know, we have a lesson in tyrants abusing powerful yes. things that if you have And which comes first? Right, which comes first? I mean, does the do, do the people that are censoring people on the internet because they have the information highway, right? They control it. They have that power. Are they are they doing it because they can? Right? They didn't go into creating this super information highway where everybody can share everything specifically to censor people, right? So this this kind of emergence, but it, it, are we fated as a species if we build something powerful? Like Stalin took over communism. I'm not a communist, but that's the history. Stalin took over communism, right? And he was a tyrant. Is, do, is it just because it's a tool for, you know, power and influence? Or do powerful and influenced people create things to, to have that power? That's something that I, I really tried to think about. Were you going to say something, Garth, about that? No, no, I think it's quite provocative. Oh, okay. Was... Okay, yeah, um, um, that... That connection, that link between the association between technology and tyranny is something people really worry about right now. Uh, mm. From surveillance to uh, to uh, drones, and, um, super warriors, things like that. I mean, super soldiers. Does uh, are tyrants attracted to technology, or uh, what? Co which comes first? Is it the technology or the tyranny? And I wondered how. First of all, just how. Uh, I don't know if we can ever say which comes first, but how ancient are the roots of that link? And in fact, they go all the way back. We just we just saw that Zeus, in all these myths from uh, three thousand years ago, uh, he's the ty he's the tyrant, and he uses technology to oppress and harm uh, the people that he should be taking care of if he's if he was a good god. And that's another question: um, what what do creators owe? Their creations. We talked about that a little bit with Prometheus and Victor Frankenstein. Um, but yeah. uh, so Zeus, Zeus is using technology, commissioning all these things. Um, but then uh, King Minos. We have kings who are using uh, technology, uh, and yeah. they're uh, they're usually very very powerful rulers, like the one who set the um, set the uh, Robo Bronze Bulls against Jason, or had the command. Uh, owned the army that uh that popped up out of the ground mm -hmm. and so we see it in the, in the mythology so i wonder does this is did this happen in real real life too in ancient history and i could trace the link between technology and tyranny at least back to uh, uh the sixth century bc with examples of kings that commissioned craftsmen and engineers to make uh machines uh, that would torture uh, people and harm people. So and consolidate uh, the power. Yeah, it's right mean. there. It's right there in the history as well. well and the other thing is the connection you... to war. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Oh no, the, ahead, the great story that you have in your book about, um, I believe it was Minos, uh, one of his architects and builders thought I'll get on your good side by creating this great bronze bull that a person could be put inside of and then yes. roasted alive and with a special <laughs> tubes and horns so that the howling oh. of the dying, the, I mean, it's just, it's yes. just the most horrific way to die. And what does King Mino say? It's the cruelty of opportunity, right? He's like, yeah, yeah. you sure it works? I don't know, man. You better, I want to see those, <laughs> just go in there, just like hollow through those, those show me how it works. Crawl in yeah, there. show me how it works. The guy gets in and 
Milos <laughs> closes the door, lights the fire, and says, yeah, man, that's really cool, and burns the guy alive. <laughs> Where's the that's joy right. in creating? <laughs> <laughs> the joy in creating. So the, the power there is, oh, listen, you may be able to create the bulb, but I own it because I own you. And this yes. subservience of other people. I've got a really fascinating uh, fact to tell you guys. I think this predates the evolution of our species because in chimpanzees, if a male chimpanzee is being threatened by another male chimpanzee for access to females in the troop, they make themselves large and the size they, you know, make themselves, come on, Garth, I'm challenging you. Make yourself large. There you go. Yeah, exactly. So they make themselves, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They no. have the, the largeness of the animal and how loud they are and how much movement they can affect in the field of vision of the other primates determines who's on top, right? And so what does some males, they, some males have figured out that it's not just enough to show the largeness of your torso and your body, but they'll grab a tree and a bush and they'll start shaking that tree and bush because that tree and bush movement <laughs> counts because they did that. That's technology in yeah. non-human primates yeah. to assert yeah. power, to grab power. And so in that situation, it probably was found out by accident. Somebody fell over and then it gets reinforced in the genes. Somebody fell over and knocked yeah. over a tree. Everyone went, whoa. That big guy. Okay. <laughs> right. That was just like <laughs> accidental. And that got reinforced and those genes spread. And so then it became like a, you know, an adaptive behavior or it was learned or maybe, maybe culturally because the monkeys, the chimpanzees, I should say, which are not monkeys, they can see it and then they remember it. And they say, well, okay, wow, that guy's pretty awesome. I'm going to go shake a tree myself. Uh, right. So if it predates our species, then it's not a surprise to me that the, that the lesson is there i think it's 100 yeah. percent predictable that people right power corrupts absolute power up corrupts absolutely it's been said a million and a half times but the point is it's is it fundamental to our species so fundamental that we can't overcome it that's to me the more important question can we emerge from our primate ancestry right we have so many hangovers from the even the pleistocene from our caveman days Right, the differences and you know and, and tribalism and all of the rest. It, I would hope that technology is unifying, not dividing. And right. it's turned out to be found seized upon by those who would divide us, and it's being used expertly right now to keep us apart. Oh yes, and it's tearing our society right. apart. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's uh, it's pretty scary. I mean, um, especially when you think about the uh, the the uh, disinformation that we get about inventions like the Boston Dynamics robots. I mean, they right around New Year's, they they put out a, um, a video of uh, their robot dancing mm -hmm. uh, to make mm -hmm. him seem more human and friendly. Mm -hmm. And they said, people have a better idea of robots if we show them dancing. And I'm just, that really gives me chills because, uh, and all these graduate students who help them dance, you know, program it to be able to do dancing those are skills that it will use in warfare it's not they're not making a dancing robot and a friendly happy dancing robot they're dancing <laughs> on the graves of a thousand conquered vanquished yes. foes they might. i mean yes. they might they might you know you ever see michael jackson the you know the thriller video they could that could be their approach that could be how they march uh, you know just because they can <laughs> they're just showing off you know, the yes. uncanny valley. I find this very interesting. I, I want to bring this up, which is sort of like my like this uncanny valley thing, which is all about technology, right? About this idea of it looking. And I was trying to to reconcile that with my own issues of um, you know fear of masks. I, I don't like I don't like being put into a situation where people are wearing a mask, even if it's just one of the you know Venetian. Uh, yeah. Uh, casino masks, you know, even those. But when they get more elaborate, clown masks, for instance, have that added thing. But Ooh. the issue that I have, I always <laughs> seem to think of, is the eyeballs that are moving behind the mask. In other words, I feel that for me, me the uncanny should, valley is about empathy. You should never tell me this. 
You should oh, never. Oh, he's going to be in masks all the time now. He's going to. Yeah, it's going to be a disaster. Oh no. Go ahead. But sorry. The, the the idea of empathy in the uncanny valley, which is that when we see something in a flash, um, we try to identify, you know, you know, animal, animal, mineral, you know, whatever, mm-hmm. and it our brain kind of goes bink. It tries to it plugs it in. So we see a a mask, and I plug in person. Okay, so immediately then my empathetic nodules in my brain start going, oh, okay, so that's someone very similar to me, similar background, going to behave the same way probably, you know, but within a range, right? Yeah. But yeah. then I look closer and I see that it's not who I thought it was. I don't know who it is. I don't know what their intentions are. I don't know what their motivations are. And I don't have, I don't know if I'm allowed to empathize or if my empathy is going to get me murdered because maybe he's holding a machete behind his back, like in a movie. So this is my my problem with uh, this uncanny Valley for me is yes, this, I think robots go through this phase, right? They're, they're in this phase right now where they look like burn victims, right? And it's, it's horrible. It's very terrible. (laughs) But part of it is this masking and inability to understand, I believe, the true motivations and intentions of that thing that I'm trying to understand that's in front of me and acting independently from an independent power source. What do you I think, think of that? that? Is that- I, I, I think that fits in exactly with one of the explanations for the Uncanny Valley, which is somebody that doesn't look like you is probably not from your tribe. Somebody that doesn't look like you is probably not from your village. Somebody that doesn't look like you and all of your relatives, they might not have your best interest in mind because they have their own tribe, troop, whatever over there. And so the other possible explanation, of course, is the disease explanation. You mentioned burn victims, but more like, you know, I've got a virus and I'm sickly, I'm pale, I'm dying. And yeah, you probably don't want to go near that. <laughs> you, you physically distance, you got a social distance. Sorry, I, I love you, but I'm not coming anywhere near you tonight. You know, this kind of thing. Um, the, uh, the, the, the fact that you have a specific thing with the mask, can, right? And you set it on video. Now the AI, AI from the future, you're its bitch because it's gonna scare you. It's gonna torture you. The AI from the future, <laughs> sorry, Adrian, is gonna read <laughs> it, this into your psyche and you are, you're done, man. You're a toast. I give up. You know, I keep, ta- I keep, ta- I keep talking with these, um, with uh, people who make robots, and they keep talking about trying to get past the, the obstacle of the uncanny valley, um, and they're trying to do things like uh, uh, try and make the movements of the eyeballs a little more human. They try to have it uh, yeah. look away every now and then, or yep. to sort of roll back on its wheels or legs or something, and have these little human-like ticks to make it seem more and more human and uh, what they're doing is just making it creepier and creepier and so i i don't understand <laughs> why don't out. why don't they just make it look like a like a like a uh, like what it is a machine um and it's interesting go back to the origin of the concept on uncanny, uncanny valley um, um masahito mori the guy who uh, came up with the concept, the roboticist, in uh, I think it was 1970s something, early 70s. He he's a roboticist, but he came up with the concept not from robots, uh, but from uh, looking at prosthetic um, prosthetic limbs and especially hands. They were hmm. making in the 70s. They were trying to make super realistic hands that could with fingers and skin and everything that could actually sort of move uh, with electricity. And this just creeped him out. And that is where he came up with the idea for the Uncanny Valley, which he then applied to uh, robotics. But what I think is interesting about that, um, what I take from it is that nowadays, look at prosthetics. They're not making them look super real and human. Mm. We have right. these people who race or uh, who have lost their legs in uh, IED attacks or uh, people who are a- a- athletes. They embrace the machine quality of the, of, of the prosthetics. And people accept that and are comfortable with it and, and trust it instead of trying to make it look super real. 
Well, so, speaking of super real, let me show you a few things. There's a website called This Person okay. Does Not Exist. Okay. Now, th this website uses AI after learning. <clears throat> what they did is they, they, they took one AI that would um, generate something that was supposed to look like a human face. And then they had another AI that would grade it. And the trick is not to tell it that it's, yes, it looks like an AI, it, it looks like a human face, but to try to fool it. That's the trick why this, the, why this particular technique worked, to try to fool it into thinking that it passed the test. It's a, it's a, a, it's a specific technique in machine learning. I want to show you these pictures of people that are AI generated. I've only got four of them up. I can get any number. You <laughs> sit, hit the button over and over and over again. It's mesmerizing. Watch this. This is an AI generated picture of a person who does not exist. This hmm. is an AI generated picture of a person who does not exist. That's I mean, we so they're. This is another one. They're not sourcing. It's de novo generation of an image that is one AI trying to fool the other into thinking that it passed the test. That's the best way I can explain it. There's a technical term for it, but I've forgotten it. It's, the website but this is, enhances their learning to think they to every time they succeed, they get better. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so they so, got pretty so good. This website, <laughs> if you spend, pretty good, man. I was fooled. If you spend <laughs> if you spend enough time with this, you start feeling empathy for some of the people. Like, oh, that could that person could be my friend, or wow, that's a really nice looking person, or this person seems friendly, or that guy looks like a jerk. And Dude, this her just name came is up. Pandora. <laughs> yeah, Pandora, there you go. This just came up. Jack sent me um, uh, an article just uh, a couple days ago, and it was funny because I immediately forwarded it to a friend of mine who's a writer, uh, Lori Frankel, who wrote a book. I think she this book came out maybe 2014-ish, um, and the title of the book was um, Goodbye for Now. And it was about – it was a fictional story set in the future where – if someone dies, you can turn in all of their social media, emails, artifacts, photographs, and then they will create an AI based on that, all the data. And then that person, that AI would start emailing you and sending you things. So now it turns out that that was, that was a fiction of my friend's imagination, but she clearly read something because Microsoft is, we don't know if they're developing it, but they do have a patent on chat bots that will collect the data of your loved ones and text with you um, throughout the day. Hey, how's it going? How's your day been? Did you finish that book that you started last month? I can't Not imagine anything creepier than getting texted <laughs> by my dead father, by the way. <laughs> so no, no. <laughs> why do people want to do this? I don't no. just because we can again, is this, is it because we have the ability? Is that why we do it to torture ourselves or, or, do we lose sight of our 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 kind of self-preservation instincts when we get toyed with this kind of technology that's really going to make a lot of people get PTSD? I think. So you, you well, Jack, maybe you can explain why why do scientists why do they seem allergic to the idea that just because you can do something you you should. Well, that's is it because they think question. someone else will do it? That, or, but that's you have part a of it. There's, there's specific... competition. Yeah, there's competition. But yeah. we're talking about aesthetics, okay? This is about aesthetics when we're talking about we have something and we want to make it look like something. So to that point in time, that's aesthetics. Or we want to give it a particular function, then that's, you know, applied technology or something like that. You know, it's, it's tool use. Um, but, yeah, this question of – you know, is technology, is Prometheus's fire something that is there for us to play with without any consequences to the people who decide to put all the chemicals, the right chemicals together at the right place in the right time, you know, uh, that, 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 that leads to artificial life that becomes the gray slime that takes over the world, you know. Uh, and, and, and I don't have the answer towards why other than curiosity. For, you know, people have differences of opinion of aesthetics. Some people love Garth's books. 
let's say. Okay? <laughs> everybody loves everybody so, loves my book. Like, <laughs> I did I did I did I say that everybody loves Garth's Garth, Garth Stein's books, but some people might not uh, enjoy a particular AI created something or the other, or, or a particular the, the the movie industry has been trying to go through this AI the the, the uncanny mm. valley and has lost tons of money on movies that flopped, right? So cats. The, Cats, for yeah, instance. Cats, yeah, yeah. But also <laughs> Polar Express. Polar Express is well known as maybe the creepiest movie ever made. And if you ever just watched really? the trailer on YouTube, oh yeah, it's a all. It oh. was the first ever. Tom Hanks is in it, and it was a. It's a children's story about the North Pole, and all. Yeah. Um, everything was. It was the first fully motion activated uh, motion. Oh. How do they say it? You know, they had everybody in their suits, and they yeah. did. They had people acting, and then they layered over the animation oh, yes. and so it's like super creepy it's way <laughs> creepy <laughs> oh my god don't watch it but you and I, to bed. you and i have a very low threshold for the uncanny valley other people don't <laughs> but you know the uncanny valley is a real thing because there was a there was a movie where there was a there was a, a very popular movie shrek i think it was where they were going to mm. do exactly that and they showed it to b children and they started crying because it was just <laughs> wrong. It was just, just, Scare it the children work for me. So no. they decided to make it less realistic. They had to go back down yeah. the other side of the uncanny valley. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. In, in terms of morality, it's always a choice, people. When you have technology, you always have a choice with how far you're willing to take it, no matter what it is. It's just like in science. There's no magic way to measure something. You just do it really, really well and do it objectively. You know, but you do have to think about the external costs. That's part of this is a cultural issue that I'm uh, uh, one of my hobby works is, is the fundamental problem with Western culture, as I see it, is that profit by any means is OK, even if it's at the cost of the other that you've externalized. In fact, that could be seen as a benefit because you're you're savvy, you're smart. But that externalized cost can come in the terms of human pain and suffering that you don't you're not accountable for. Right, so if I'm selling a brownie, it's a good transaction. You buy my brownie, you send, give me four dollars. You know, I'm I'm trying to put my kids through school. Four dollar brownies, okay. So, four dollar brownie, that's good if I'm using wholesome, healthy ingredients. But if I have pesticides in there that I could have gotten out by buying more expensive ingredients, I'm passing the future, your future pain and suffering. I'm buying. I'm you're paying me extra. But because I'm not going to be held responsible for your future pain and suffering. So I separate good money in economics from bad money. And bad money is when you've externalized cost in, in a way that leads to human pain and suffering. So I think we freaked everybody out pretty well tonight. Um, I'm really glad how this <laughs> went. Um, but I want to leave us, if we could, uh, I'll let you guys have your parting shots here and, and close out with your own thoughts. But uh, I have a surprise for you at the end. I'd like to share with you something that well, might set, settle the score, so to speak. So, Settle the score. <laughs> settle the score. All right. So you know who Antoni uh, Dvorak is? Yes. The Czech composer. Czech so, composer. Yeah. So he had a symphony that he hadn't finished. And someone found it. It was discovered years after he died. Someone found it. And a pianist, you know, started filling in the blanks. Some and published, kind of filling in some of the blanks. Somebody stopped the process and said, "Hey, wait a minute! I have this, I have this computer program that writes music. I can train it on everything that Dvorak has ever composed, and then seed it with this unfinished symphony, this unfinished, you know, concert. So let's play this, okay?" It's um, A I V A. I guess you would call it Iva loves the Vorjak.
Yeah, it's not so bad. <laughs> right? Lovely. Is this a trick? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, one of the things we didn't talk about is the appeal. The appeal to convenience, the appeal to uh, boasting rights, the social credit, you know, the social standing for having the next t cool thing, you know, this this part of our culture. I think you called it a hyper bandwagon in your article. <laughs> I don't remember that. Thank you for remembering. When you were talking about uh, um, uploading uh, uploading uh, new memory storage and things we like that. The yeah, it's yeah. I mean, human brain. right. So we're going to save all that for a future episode to go into detail. Yeah, we have another. We have a whole. We got more to talk about, but we we'll do that later. To talk about. <laughs> yeah, we'll definitely do that later after it's published. But thank you for. for I, I'm honored that you remembered that. Thank you. So, Garth, <laughs> Garth, your parting shots, my friend, as we close out. What, what did you learn tonight? What are you going to tell your family and friends now? I don't know, man. L last night at dinner, I, I have uh, three sons. Um, 24, 22, and 13. And we were having dinner last night, and I said, it never occurred to you guys that there's a strong likelihood that we're all robots? <laughs> and <laughs> they, we, we went around about it and, and quantum theories and, and how the mathematical likelihood and so forth, um, as well as the other ideas of just like, does a robot know he or she is a robot? Um, and then where is that? And where is the sense of autonomy? And where is the morals and the ethics? And who's doing the teaching? And 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 the bottom line is, I, the problem with a symphony that's created or finished or uh, 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 created in the sort of uh, in the name of someone like Dvorak, it kind of destroys our need for authenticity on anything. And I find it horribly depressing. I'm sorry. I really do. I think we want we want to think that 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 humanity is behind um, brilliant things, and and maybe we can't be behind all the brilliant things because the bottom line is there's a Go computer out there that taught itself how to how to play Go and is way better than anybody could ever be ever. So that the number one Go player in the world had to retire because he said this is I can never be as good as that computer. Mm -hmm. I mean that's like that's that's so that's can you imagine being like your entire life spent like to be the best human go player and then you're there and that some computer just kicks your butt like a hundred times in a row and you're like there's no more need for me to be alive but let me and so where that. is that let me challenge need to that. Be alive? let me challenge that garth this person who spent his entire life you said it yourself learning how to master one thing is now free to go into any direction they want to doesn't AI I don't know, man. I think he's suffering from PTSD, uh, you know, te technology PTSD. There's got to be a new frame <laughs> for this because it's like, the, right? It's like the disheartenment of Amer of the world, of humanity is like, we no longer need you. Then what are we going to do? Then we're going to go spend all of our time watching, you know, YouTube videos created by an artificial intelligence unit. Well, we'll be totally addicted. Probably. Uh, AI will hack us to the point where we have to have the music and we have to have the, the movie. We have to have right? the With relationship. Right, with and all that stuff. Of it's, course. It's just, it's very, it's, I, I hope that, um, I hope that, that like in the, in the, in the shadow of the great, um, Fahrenheit for Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, you know, I hope that humanity can remember the stories and the books and tell them to each other instead of having them uh, curated by a super intelligence for our own good. I guess that's my concern. You don't want to be plugged in. Got it. So, <clears throat> right. I That's, don't want to be plugged in. Yeah. So this <laughs> this guy that did that 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 spent all of his life on this on this game. Um, what if he goes into biochemistry and he's the guy that figures out a cure for cancer? You know, I mean, it it, it he was kind of perseverating, wasn't he? I mean, like, um, it's not a worthwhile thing to just master the same game better than. I, he's basically. I, look, I don't let think me put it this way. Let me put it this way. Why does he have to shake that tree again? He's already. I guess he it. doesn't have to. I guess that right. maybe he. I don't believe he said he was going to go throw himself off 
a bridge. I believe he said <laughs> that there's no more need for him to ever play Go again. Right. The game has been destroyed for him. So I, I don't know. But meanwhile, we are all going to be faced with this. I mean, to 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 hear something beautiful, to go see a painting at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, and you stand and you gaze at it, and you it moves you emotionally, and then you cry and you feel this thing, and then you turn around and walk away, and your docent puts her arm around you and says. It was created by artificial intelligence. And so was I. <laughs> Isn't there something? <laughs> <laughs> and so was I. And your dose says, and so, so was I. So the, the, anyway. the, point, is, the point is that this, this guy that was, that was so good at Go, um, could, my point is anyway, that, that this guy that was so good at it really made a flaw in logic because he's still the best human at it. He's still the best human. I can never jump as high as the, some robot that's going to be created in the future. And it doesn't touch my ego at all. It's a robot. It, it doesn't make any sense just because something can type faster than I can that I, oh my gosh, I'm You know terrible. what? If you were Fosbury who, right? Fosbury, who invented the Fosbury flop and became the highest high jumper in the world back in the old days... <laughs> He would he would be depressed that a robot could jump higher than he. Could. It's a, so it's a robot. Anyway, I'd rather let's hear what Adrian has to say. I, I really want you to <laughs> you give me some wisdom and give me hope for the future, please, <laughs> <laughs> Professor. Well, I'm, I'm a, it's 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 really funny. I I really I'm I also um, not happy with uh, all this helping AI and smart appliances and things like that. I, uh, I don't. I've never spoken to Siri. I've never met Alexa. I, I have an old car that I roll up the windows myself. I mean, I don't want a refrigerator that tells me I'm running out of mayo and then orders it and puts it in. I, I just can't do it. Um, but um, I just. Uh, I don't. I think that a whole thing that we didn't get into that's related to all this AI and sort of searching and trying to imitate and then. Um, uh, imitate nature and then maybe even improve on it and then surpass nature i think mm -hmm. that's a really timeless human impulse and we could see it in the in the in the ancient stories about creating uh, artificial life but um we didn't talk about the quest for immortality or at least uh, longevity which uh these same people who really um are seeking all this artificial life whether it be uh, robots or AI or uh, making their lives longer that all the problems that they're not foreseeing there just just to, I mean little not forget immortality that causes huge problems but just incredible longevity is going to cause a lot of problems as well um, what happens to reproduction do, do people have kids or will they just have robot pets now or um, what happens to uh, evolution we won't be evolving anymore if we're all immortal or living uh, really long lives what happens to uh, learning things um, but really it goes to what you're saying Garth about being human what is the difference then between uh, human and non-human and if you think about who is immortal who does live forever gods right did do gods ever sacrifice themselves do they ever no one ever says gods are brave or courageous they don't they, they don't have it and why because the stakes are very low for the gods because they're immortal they can't die and if if we're seeking that then uh the things that that make us human like self self-sacrifice and empathy and and just courage because we have high stakes we have those things because we have high stakes, it's life or death for us. And, mm -hmm. if, and if you take that away, um, I, uh, I think that's a problem. Beautifully stated, thank you. Thank you. I, I don't know, Garth, I think that this first episode was right out of the ballpark. I, I'm so happy. I think it was great. Adrian. I think we have to have her back. I think you have to come back, Adrian. If that's is this okay. the first episode? I didn't realize that. Absolutely. Yeah, cool. <laughs> well, I'm so, so honored. What you wrote was so foundational. If you think about Thank it, you. it has instances of every possible thing that we're going to go into 
in the future. So let's bring up that book one more time for the diehards that stayed with us all throughout this. <laughs> and, and you know, I tend to um, recommend IndieBound.org as a place to find books. So you can uh, bookshop.org is also a great place. Um, if yeah. I could give a plug to bookshop.org, which uh, supports all independent booksellers. And if you want to listen to it on um, uh, the audio book is, is narrated by um, the professor mayor. So uh, I listened to, uh, I listened to it and uh, really enjoyed, really enjoyed having her with me in my ear as I went for walks <laughs> and stuff. So um, uh, Libro FM is a great source for um, uh audiobooks that uh, donate partial proceeds to independent bookstores as well. Agreed. So let's you can tell say, I'm a novelist because I'm supporting my independent bookstore. Yes. <laughs> I want Excellent. to say thank you to uh, Ava for contributing her or his or its contribution to the collaboration with Dvorak. Uh, just not to leave anybody out, we have other guests that we should acknowledge. Thank you for being here <laughs> today on the Uncanny Valley. You guys really, you know, are kept to yourselves and that's probably good for now but <laughs> nevertheless we are not angry with you and you're so temporary you you know no one will ever see these faces again unless this video you know uh goes viral uh because that computer program um <clears throat> this person does not exist does never generates the same face twice Oh, every face is brand new and unique when you hit the refresh button. So if you want, these, what's that website again, Jack? It's <laughs> this person does not exist dot com. It's a whole population huh. then. it's a whole city. It's an infinite number of, of temporary people. Faces. It's an absolute infinite number of limited only by the number of browsers pointed at the uh, at the website and the number. Of what a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's just the worst. Well, see, that's funny because they're not real. They're pixels on the screen. That's, oh, that's the... oh, they're gonna they're gonna be the faces of the AI that's gonna torment you in yeah. ten years. AI is coming after you, and it's gonna look like one of those people. <laughs> yeah. What do you mean right. I'm not real? That's right. So <laughs> please like and share this if you're on YouTube, and please tag people on Facebook who you think might be interested in. Uh, journey, our journey into the Uncanny Valley. If you have a recommended guest who you think might like to come on the Uncanny Valley and spend time like this with Garth and I, get a hold of us on Facebook. Get a hold either one of us. You can email, I guess, executive producer at unbreakingscience.com. Ask Grace, you know, just, just find and me. And an AI will get back to you. Yeah, we'll have an AI <laughs> get back to you. Uh, Thank you so much, Adrian. And, and Thank you. Are you working on any great. other books? I, I forgot to ask. Are you working on another book? I, I'm working on um, updating uh, and re revising a, an earlier book called Greek Fire, Poison Arrows, and Scorpion Bombs, Biological and Chemical Warfare in the Ancient World. So I'm updating all the modern examples that we have. Awesome. Uh, Look at Garth's face. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> that we have, uh, now we have technology. Yep. Now let's find out how humans destroy each other. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You've got a very, very, very keen audience in Garth Stein. I think he's your number one fan, though. <laughs> yeah. I, loved, I loved the book. Thanks for being with us. We're Thank signing you off so much. here. I'll okay. end screen here. Thank you, guys. Thank you.